out in local churches when ministers are away from their pulpits. July's been fun, and I'll be back for two more Sundays in August as we continue in our series called Real Theology, where we take a look at some movies that raise theological themes and consider the ways in which those themes might relate to our Christian walk. Our streak continues. This is three for three beautiful summer Sundays, and I hope that following the service, you have a plan to go out and enjoy it. As we begin worship, we light the Christ candle as a symbol of the light that came into the world in creation. A light more fully revealed than Jesus Christ, a light that shines in the darkness such that the darkness will not overcome it. And we also light the pride candle as a statement that all people are valued and welcome in this place, and we celebrate diversity in all of its forms. And as we gather this morning, we also pause to remember that in this region, we live and work and worship on lands that are the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. May we live with respect on the land and at peace with all of its people. Our opening song of meditation this morning is Spirit of Life. You'll find the words on the screens. You're welcome to stand if you'd like or sit if you're more comfortable. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We rejoice in giving God thanks and praise. Our hymn is Will You Come and Follow Me, number 567 in the hymn books and also on the streets. <laughs> Thank you. 
opening prayer is said together, you'll find the words in the bulletins and again on the screens. Gracious God, we name this an opening, opening prayer. prayer. To call it an opening, opening prayer suggests it's an opening into something more. An opening of a door to this time of worship. We ask your blessing so that this is exactly what it is as we worship this morning. Nurture our faith and our trust, fullness of your gifts. Open doors on our life's journey and reveal to us a room filled with life, hope, and promise. A life we can genuinely call journey of discipleship as followers of Jesus. We turn to you, knowing that you understand us, forgive us, and love us like a mother. And so we pray with confidence and faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There's something special about what we do when we gather to worship with others. God creates us to come together. And in that togetherness, we inevitably have an influence on one another. We have families and friends and church community and all kinds of places in our day-to-day -day lives where we're with other people. And when we're together, we teach each other all kinds of things about how to navigate in this world. We teach each other all kinds of things by the way we live our lives. And one of those things is that we teach each other what we believe and what we see and what we value about God. You know, if you have to come up with one word to describe God, what might it be? Love. Excellent. Somebody else? Hope. Hope. Whatever. Yeah. Patience. Yeah. Compassion. Excellent. Acceptance. Perfect. Perfect. These are all attributes of God, and they become attributes of ours as we seek to take on those attributes and share them with the world in the way that we live our lives. All of those things that we see in God, that we value about God, become ways in which we live out God's presence in the world around us. Each generation having something valuable to share with the next each of us being God to one another, seeing God in one another. Ryan's going to share our scripture with us this morning. A reading from Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I informed you in the womb, I knew you and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, ah, Lord God, do I truly know how to speak for I'm only a boy? But the Lord said to me, don't ever say I'm only a boy. You shall go to all whom I send you and you shall speak whatever I command you. Don't be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And then the Lord put out his hand, and he touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck, to pull down, to destroy, and to overthrow, to build, and to plant. A reading from Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, 
Let us all lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with the perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of that joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand at the throne of God. This summer in our Real Theology series, we've been looking at movies that have something to say to us from a theological perspective. One of the challenges and the joys is in getting to choose those films. And today it's what I would have to call one of my favorite movies of all time. And it's a bit of an oldie, relatively speaking. How many of you remember Simon Birch when it hit the theaters in 1998? We're going back a while, 24 years ago, but it's still out there on YouTube, on Apple TV, on Google Play, as well as home video, though I will admit I've discovered that my copy is VHS and I no longer own a VCR. So <laughs> I, I actually had to stream it to watch it again for the sermon. <laughs> And if you've seen it, you might recognize some of the scenery. Parts of that movie were filmed in Lunenburg and down in Blue Rocks. So just an hour or so away. Simon Birch is a classic coming of age story set in 1964 in fictional small town, Gravestown, Maine. It's very loosely based on John Irving's novel, A Prayer for Owen Meany, though it cuts the second half of the book and changes the ending. So much so that uh, the author said, no, 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 you've got to rename that. This is no longer a prayer for Owen Meany. This is something else. So they've called it Simon Birch. And it's framed as the flashbacks of an adult, Joe Wentworth, who is played by Jim Carrey as an adult and Joseph Mazzello as a youth. Tells the story of a year in the life of his childhood best friend, a 12-year-old boy named Simon Birch who was played absolutely brilliantly by Ian Michael Smith, who hasn't played in anything else, strangely enough. He's a software developer now. But despite all of his physical disabilities, Simon Birch believes that God has a plan for his life. Simon was born very tiny and with an abnormally small heart. No one expected him to live beyond the first 24 hours of his life. But he surprises everyone by living into his early teen years. A disappointment to his parents and the target of all kinds of childhood pranks because of his miniature size and his odd sounding voice. Simon has every reason to be questioning his self-worth and his purpose for living. But he embraces his condition and believes that God will use him in a unique and possibly heroic way. Joe, who is Simon's best friend, doesn't believe in God, and he's not the only one who doubts that God has a plan for Simon. Simon's schoolmates mock him relentlessly, believing his assertions to be just one more indicator that this kid is more than a little bit weird. On one occasion, his Sunday school teacher tries to hush him up so he won't frighten the other children with his musings. And I will warn you that the church is no shining star in this movie. Both the minister and his Sunday school teacher treat little Simon very badly. The small town's minister, Reverend Russell, doubts that God could possibly have a plan for little Simon Birch. There's a very poignant conversation between Simon and the minister where Simon asks, does, does God have a plan for all of us? And the minister hesitantly says, well, I'd like to think so. And Simon says, me too. I think God made me the way I am for a reason. And the minister gets kind of cool and he says, uh, I, I'm glad that your faith uh, helps you to deal with your, your condition. It's not what I mean, Simon says. I think I'm God's instrument and he's going to use me to carry out his plan. The minister's a bit dumbfounded by this and says, yeah, it's wonderful to have faith, son, but let's not overdo it. And with that, he kind of waves Simon out of his office and shakes his head and 
rolls his eyes, God's instrument. And through the movie, Simon has a number of these conversations with significant people in his life who keep seeming to want to devalue him. There are also some wonderfully comedic scenes where it's clear that despite his disabilities, Simon is still a typically young boy entering puberty and learning how to relate to girls. And there are several subplots involving a fateful baseball game that I won't spoil for you. In the critical action scenes near the end of the movie, Simon and his good friend Joe find themselves helping with a group of younger children heading on a winter camping trip. They're all piled into a school bus heading down an icy road. And suddenly the school bus driver veers to avoid hitting a deer. He loses control and the school bus plunges down into an icy body of water. Everyone in the front of the bus evacuates out the door, but Simon and a handful of the other students in the back are trapped as the, boat be as the bus begins to sink. And Simon takes charge. He opens a window and commands all the little ones to climb out. And last of all, Simon escapes through the window with the help of his friend, Joe. In the hospital following the accident, Joe assures Simon that all the little ones are all right. And Simon says, did, did you see how the children looked at me and listened to me because of the way I look? And Joe with tears in his eyes says, yeah. With satisfaction, Simon says that that window was just my size. Extra small, Joe says with a smile. And a few seconds later, Simon dies, knowing that God has used him. Now, I didn't say this movie is not a tearjerker. It is. I know it's coming. I cry every time, even last night sitting on my couch. But what Simon doesn't know before he dies is that because of his unwavering faith, his friend Joe now believes in God. That statement is actually the main point of the opening scene of the movie. Some 20 years after the accident, we see an adult Joe Wentworth gazing down on the headstone of Simon Birch in the church cemetery and saying, I'm doomed to remember a boy with a wrecked voice, not because of his voice or because he was the smallest person I ever knew, or even because he was the instrument of my mother's death, but because he is the reason I believe in God. What faith I have, I owe to Simon Birch. It is Simon who made me a believer. Simon knows that he was created for a purpose, but somehow manages to get under absolutely everybody's skin and find lots of trouble as he's trying to figure out what that purpose is. His parents seem to care very little for him and it's his best friend Joe and Joe's mom that are the ones who really seem to care about Simon. Add to that Joe and Simon's search for Joe's biological father, who his mother refuses to identify. And you've got a movie with all kinds of subplots to follow. And it really gets under everybody's skin that Simon goes around saying he was created for a purpose. But aren't we all? Granted, we might not run around telling people that in quite the way that Simon does. But why does it bother everybody so much? Even Reverend Russell dismisses Simon's questions about his purpose. He agrees with Simon and admits that he's glad that Simon's faith helps him to deal with his condition. But when Simon leaves, the way he mutters under his breath makes you realize that he doesn't really believe what Simon is telling him. And how does a child who's basically ignored by his parents and ridiculed by everyone else come to that kind of a conclusion? Where does that faith and that certainty come from? Midway through the movie, Simon has an exchange with Joe's mother's boyfriend, Ben, when he says he's watching for a sign, sort of like Moses and the burning bush, but he guesses God's not into that kind of communication anymore. But at the same time, Simon says he feels like God needs to hurry up, that he feels that his time is running out. And one thing my time at Northwood has taught me is that when someone has a strong sense that their time is running out, they're often right, even when there seem to be no indications otherwise. But enough about Simon for a minute. We're going to talk about Jeremiah. And the passage that Ryan read for us is one that's often used at ordinations. When we talk about someone determining to allow themselves to be used as God's instrument in the world. 
Then the Lord put out a hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. The commentaries take that verb touch and point out to us that it's a very strong verb. A strong and intimate, very physical understanding of God's call on a life. Other prophets reported visions, Moses and the burning bush, I, Isaiah and the six winged seraphs. For Jeremiah, it's not only a voice, but a touch. And for him, that was enough. So in all of this, what is the word for us? Jeremiah experiences the word of God as a compelling force, one that propels him forward as God's agent, as God's instrument, as it were. We know that call too. What those things are in your heart, I don't know. I know some of them in my own life, and I know some of them in our common life on this planet. There's no shortage of ways in which the church can be an influence for good, both in situations and in individual lives. This is holy work, to be people with ears and hearts open to the call, open to the moving of the Spirit. Now for his trouble, Jeremiah was abandoned and rejected by his own people. He suffers with them, for them, and because of them. This is Jeremiah's story. This is the young man who heard the voice of God and acted on it for the rest of his life. His call is vibrant and vital. And though he doesn't write about his own inner motivation and struggle, it seems that at the worst of times when he wondered if it was worth it, those were the times when he was drawn back again to his call, to the words of God grounding him and holding him when everything else seemed to fall away, even his own belief that his call was true. That call was also heard by others. And then in the, in the discernment processes of denominations, for ministers that I'm familiar with, it's a critical one. Having others confirming that call of God in our lives is a huge part of how we figure out what it is. They witness not only to the call of God in, our, in their lives, but reveal it in ours. Next year, it'll be 25 years since I arrived, barely 21, ink scarcely dry on my arts degree at Acadia Divinity College. It was my first time living away from home, and many of the 25 or so other first-year students were in the same boat. We were there because we felt called to be there, but at the same time, we were a little intimidated, a little frightened, a little overwhelmed at what we'd committed ourselves to, and some of us more than a little. But I'll never forget one of the first things they did with us during orientation. The professors who were leading the morning distributed sheets of photocopier paper cut out in the shape of clouds. And then they handed us magic markers. And some of us began to wonder if this was seminary or elementary school. The passage from Hebrews that I chose for this morning was read to us. And we were asked to think about our own cloud of witnesses, about those people of faith who had been an important part of our journey th thus far. And we were asked to write their names on those clouds, professors too. And then we spent the next hour or so sharing the story of who that person was, how God had used them in our lives, and why that was important to us. When each of us had finished, we were asked to take our paper cloud and thumbtack it to the bulletin board on the, on the wall in the large teaching classroom where we were, and where, as it turned out, most of the first year classes were taught. By the end of the session, that bulletin board was absolutely covered. It was a simple thing, but also an amazing experience. Something so simple and yet so profound. Because it taught us a lot about each other. It reminded us of the people who had supported us and been part of our call in some way. And having those paper clouds pinned up in that classroom served as a very tangible reminder to us every time we were in that classroom that we were not alone, that God had used someone as our Simon Birch, that someone had been God's instrument in our lives, and moreover, that we were there to grow in our knowledge and our ability to be used by God in the lives of other people as we developed in ministry and went forward from that place. But of course, this is not just ministers. 
All of us who are believers believe that we are called by our baptism to be saints, to be God's instruments in the world, just like little Simon was. So when we look at Simon's story, we might well ask ourselves these questions too. What do you think you're being called to do? Is there a little tug at your heart to do something or to get more involved or to do something differently? What is it? Maybe you'll recognize it at the time. Maybe you'll see it in hindsight. There was Simon, firm in his insistence that he was God's instrument. He didn't quite know what that was going to be, but he knew there was something. Simon believes that God has chosen him for a mission in life. This is a period piece set in a time when the church played a much more central role in society than it does today. Much of the story, much of Joe and Simon's lives revolve around their local church. Joe's mother brings both of the boys to Sunday school. And yet this is also a story that reminds us that the influence of the church has not always been positive. We see events happen that could easily create issues down the road. Simon gets a lot of grief in church. His Sunday school teacher is cold and unfeeling. Outspoken Simon often finds his theological views in opposition to those of the teacher and even of the pastor. When Reverend Russell is asking God's help for a fundraiser, Simon stands up on his pew and proclaims out loud, I doubt if God is interested in our church activities. If the bake sale is a priority, we are all in a lot of trouble. When Simon's antics disrupt the children's pageant and the, the Christmas children's pageant scenes are brilliant. They're among the best parts of the movie. Reverend Russell tells Simon after those escapades that everyone needs a rest from him and it would be best if he didn't come to church for a while. It's heartbreaking. But how often have we done that to people intentionally or unintentionally as a church? The movie doesn't give us a very flattering view of the church, the minister or the Sunday school teacher. And yet with all of its flaws, the church warts and all is what was for Simon an instrument of God's grace despite itself. God lives and works and speaks even within a group of flawed and sinful and sometimes loveless human beings. The Apostle Paul says we are no better than pots of earthenware to contain this treasure. But the amazing truth is that contain this treasure we do. Now, what would you say if I stood up here and told you that you are God's instrument? And so am I. So often we think of our relationship with God as being a little bit more hands off. That as Bette Midler sang all those years ago, God is watching us from a distance, that this is a very hands-off kind of thing. But what about that cloud of witnesses that surround us? I'm not sure they're really all that far away. Their lives have influenced ours in some pretty profound ways. And what effect does that have on us? I think it becomes a motivator. It fuels us. And that's precisely why I think those professors had us do that activity with the paper clouds and the magic markers. That verse from Hebrews that Ryan read earlier says, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us run. So this cloud of witnesses, who are they and what does their witnessing mean? These are not only the saints who lived and died so valiantly by faith, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Moses and all of those characters we read about in the scriptures. Those are the great characters of church history. But in our own lives, there have also been the witnesses, those people whose walks have profoundly touched and inspired our own. And it is in no small way humbling to realize that we may be those people for others as well, that we too along with all believers since the beginning of time, are among that cloud of witnesses, that we too are indeed God's instruments in the world. 
Since its arrival in theaters in 1998, my first year of seminary, I've, I've watched the movie Simon Birch more than a couple of times, probably at least a dozen or more, to the point that my little tabby cat's name was, you guessed it, Simon. And every time I see it, I get something new out of it. It's definitely a, a movie that makes us think about our faith and where God fits into things. If you've seen it before, it's worth watching it again. It's a wonderful story about faith and friendship and God's plan for us all. And here's what I love. Simon Birch is not the only one who is God's instrument. We all are. We're all used to carry out God's plan in the world. Simon may be more aware of it than most of us are, but it doesn't change the truth of it. Toward the end of the movie, Simon is talking to his pastor again, and as he draws nearer to his purpose, he's looking for some reassurance that God really does have a plan. And he says to the pastor something that I think all of us have said at least to ourselves at some point, and possibly even out loud to someone else. He says, I want to know that there's a reason for things. I used to be certain, but now I'm not so sure. I want you to tell me that God has a plan for me and a plan for all of us. We can all relate to that, I think. And though Reverend Russell doesn't respond to Simon's question with the faith that one might hope for, we can. So let us go out and live that way. To live as though we are the way we are, in the situations in which we are, with the people with whom we are, for a reason. Let us live as if God has a plan for us. Let us be God's instrument because we are, because we all are. And above all else, may we know the call of God who knows us intimately since before the world began, the God who is with us always to the end of the age. Amen. Our hymn for this time in the service is I the Lord of Sea and Sky, number 509.
I had another group. I and you're like, right, we're not alone. I to keep going. We're not alone. We live in God's world, in the words of the creed, <laughs> <laughs> which is what comes next. <laughs> Both in, in, at uh, number 518 in the books and also on the screens. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life and in death, in life beyond death, God is with us, we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Brian will lead us in the, in the minute for mission. Every child has the right to learn. Your generous support through mission and service means that children around the world can go to school thanks to partnerships with organizations like the Kenya Alliance for Advancement of Children, or known as the KAARC. School fees, violence, child labor, discrimination mean that too many children can't go or stay in school. The KARC brings together child rights organizations to share information about child's protection and safeguarding and to support children in schools. Thanks to your support, the KAARC has established over 300 child rights clubs in schools. One of these clubs helped Meshach through primary school, a bursary program that helps him pay his high school fees and the child's right clubs at his school is teaching him just how to be a positive role model. He says, I started going to school and it was a problem. The KARC has helped me. They encouraged me a lot. They enabled me to start my primary school and now I'm in high school, Meshek says. The club is helping us a lot too. They give us role models who teach us what it is bad and what is good and to be confident in whatever we're doing. I'm very happy. So thank you for helping to break down the barriers so every child can go to school regardless of who they are where they live, or how much money they have. Efforts like that are just one of the things that our offerings and our gifts are able to support. We've not been passing a plate during the service, but there was a box on the table on your way in. If you, have a, if you plan to give, that's the place to do it. And if you didn't catch it on the way in, there are plates on the way out. And so we give of our time and our talent and our treasure. For all of these together are what brings God's purpose forward in the world. Our offering hymn is Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow, number 541 in the hymn books or on the screens. abounds with gifts. Receive these offerings as a sign of our trust in you and our intention to live surrounded by your mercy, inspired by your spirit, open to the joy of your presence, hospitable to one another, and generous toward the world in which we live. Amen. You may be seated. Let us come before God together in prayer. 
Lord Jesus Christ, you tell us not to be afraid of what the future holds, not to worry about tomorrow, but you know how difficult we find it to heed your words. We worry about so many things, our families, our friends, our circumstance, things we see happening in the world around us. Some worries bigger, some worries just the tiny niggling things that eat away at us. And we come before you this morning with all of those things in the confidence that we know we can lay them all at your feet. We bring the big worries about health and happiness and security for ourselves and our loved ones. We bring the big worries about the world we live in and its future existence as we continue to fail to address so many of the ecological problems of the world. We bring big worries about the way we see people in our world being treated as less than human, exploited, abused, neglected. God, we know that you are concerned with every aspect of our lives. And so we also bring the little things that concern us, the worries that keep us awake at night, the worries that only you know. Living God, reach out to all those for whom the future brings fears and uncertainties. Assure them that you are with them, even when that future seems dark and circumstances feel like they spiral out of control. Remind them and remind us that you are able to transform even the bleakest of situations, to bring healing and to bring wholeness. We make our prayers in faith, for we know that your spirit is at work in our world, making all things new. You are a God who knows us and chose us before you formed us in the womb. And as we go into our world, when we leave this place, fill us with a faith that speaks your word, a hope that does not disappoint, a love that bears all things for your sake until that day when we shall know you fully, even as we are known by you. Amen. Now I understand I've missed this the last couple of Sundays, but there are normally some announcements that are made at this point in the service. So do we have slides with those or someone who'd like to bring something to our attention? Good morning, Jim Ball, Chair of the Executive. I just thought it's important to mention that um, today is a trial uh, for the first Sunday for the new audio system, and I think it's working splendidly. Where's Byron? He's put so many hours and, and days in putting everything together, and he's still working on the uh, visual, but the audio sound is so much improved it uh, thank you byron we're all beholden to you for that and uh, it was uh, perfect today thank you very much and i want everybody to know that the hours and days you've put in is remarkable there's new cables running everywhere you can see and reverend clark thank you for your message again it was wonderful this morning when you talked about simon and reverend russell your first sentence said Res reverend russell doubt simon's being a, a a message. I thought the Reverend's name was Re Reverend Russell Doat. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> he could very well have been. He could very well have been. Is there anything else that we should highlight for folks while we have the opportunity? Uh, I just want to say I have a copy of the Wizard of Oz and he wants to borrow it. Ah, that's helpful. I, I suppose I could have brought my copy of Simon Birch last week, but then we'd be hunting for a VCR. <laughs> so if you're going to find a piece of outdated AV equipment, it's usually in a church basement. <laughs> Our next hymn is People of the Way, which is one that I don't know at all. So. Well, these, uh, these words are written by Reverend Catherine. Oh. And uh, we're using a familiar tune that God is... Okay. That would be why it doesn't have a number in the hymn book. That's why you don't have it. The Catherine original. Lovely. <laughs>
many, many ways to be God's instrument in the world contained within that song. And as we go forth into the world and into the week ahead of us, we go in the strength and a presence of God who knew us before we knew ourselves, who consecrates us even now to be servants, to be instruments of God's presence and grace in the world. May God create in us hearts worthy of that calling, that we may go where we are, spe- where we are sent and speak the word that we have been given. In the name of God who created us, Christ who redeemed us, and the spirit that walks with us and strengthens us for every step of the journey. Amen. And our song. Is-